Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 22, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. What's up? So on today's show, Sam's going to be taking us through a little bit of industry news, bring us up to speed with everything that's going on within the world of film, and then, um, well, Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing Rusty Apper, and um, yeah, he's basically an independent filmmaker, music maker, uh, has a band, I believe. And um, yeah, really cool guy. We're also going to be discussing documentaries and the kind of impact that documentary has in terms of film. And um, yeah, the different ways that you can use documentary to showcase films or even expose different things. So without further ado, Sam, industry. So it's the Khan film market. It's happening online at the moment. Usually it would be, it would happen a lot, you know, at the beginning of the festival and then extend after it. But obviously there is no festival this year, so it's all online. And there's been a lot of uh, announcements. So one that I thought was quite cool is that Netflix are going to be making a musical of um, the Juneteenth. Now Juneteenth is when General Granger arrived in Texas to announce slaves are free. Now a lot of the industry are talking about this should be recognized as an actual holiday. So two guys, Farrell, Farrell and Kenya Barris, who you might know from um, Black AF or oh, right. what's the other one? Blackish. Oh. They've decided to like collaborate on a musical about that particular date, which I actually think sounds fantastic. This is a date that not many people fully know about and should know about. And why not do it more when I think of musical and I think these particular talents, I see it more as a celebrational idea rather than a mournful idea. Okay. So it'd be interesting to see what they do together really. Uh, Netflix are also looking for screenplay writers. Imagine Films, which is Ron Howard's and Brian Glazer's company, are currently looking for screenplays to do for Netflix. Unfortunately, they're only looking for action-adventure films for all ages, which means people like us, <laughs> they ain't going to be interested in what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's good to see this opening up a bit more. I mean, usually this means they're just waiting for someone who is someone to suddenly like peek up and like like they haven't it's usually a money thing mm. so we'll see we'll see Edgar Wright who recently one night in Soho was pushed from September to April has a brand new film he is going to make a film based on a book which they think is going to make loads of money called The Chain now this is a kidnapping thriller oh. it's not a comedy Edgar Wright seems to be expanding what he's been doing recently because One Night in Soho is pretty much a horror film. So next he's following that with a kidnapping thriller. Um, I think it sounds really cool because Edgar Wright's got such a distinct style. Why not see it away from comedy? At least well, he's not being lazy. He's and being he's, interesting. He, he's myself. shown he can do things outside of comedy anyway um, already. So mm. yeah. Christian Stewart has been cast to play Princess Diana. Mm. I like the look of this. Yeah, it's in a film called Spencer, directed by Pablo Laran, who did Jackie. Now, Jackie was an amazing film about Jackie Kennedy, played by Natalie Portman. She was Oscar nominated and she was absolutely brilliant. The film, being not a traditional biopic, it made it so much more interesting. And with this film, Spencer, it's only three days of Princess Diana's life. It's not really about how she died or how, you know, it's about more about the marriage between her and Charles between these three days on the Christmas period. And with Kristen Stewart being cast, She's one of the best actors working. Yeah, I think so she I think gets a lot of casting. stick where it's not deserved, especially from the like, Twilight franchise yeah. and stuff, but she's gone away and reinvigorated herself. Well, she's the only actress to be nominated for a French Oscar. With that, though... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. American actress. Um, with that, though, like because it's about the royal family and stuff, do, they have to, do you know if they have to get the rights to be able to do... I'm not sure because at the moment, like all these films, as it's the festival market, they're all trying to sell the packages. Right. So I guess so we'll, we'll find out more. I, yeah, if it's taking a particular moment, I don't know because Jackie, although it was taking a particular times, was still has some you know creative, like context that they changed it a bit. Yeah. So we'll see, but it's some really cool kind of announcements this week, and mm. yeah, we'll see how those films go along. Sounds good. Looking forward to them. Um, anyway guys, like I said, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Rusty Apper, um, so over to you Sam for the interview. Let's go. 
I'm on Trash Arts Take with Rusty Apper, musician and filmmaker and good friend who've been working with for a long time. How are you, man? I'm not too bad. How are you doing? I'm good. It's um, I feel like a, a very proactive day. I don't know if it's all the coffee, but yeah, it's been active. Well, coffee is the best way to feel proactive, even if you're doing nothing. If you feel like your veins are busy, then, you know. <laughs> exactly. Time just disappears and then it gets to 3 yeah. p.m. and you're shaking because you forgot to eat. Yeah, exactly. As long as you feel wired, it doesn't yeah. really matter what you do. So uh, what, what got you into filmmaking? Um, you know what? To be brutally honest with you, the only reason I started making films was kind of necessity. Because, I, I, you know, I was never really bothered about being a director. I was never that interested in, you know, being a big shot or anything like that. And I, I wasn't really that into creative writing. I didn't have that kind of bug where I was like, oh, I want to sit down and write a story. I, I, I found I could do it easily, but I never really was like, oh, yeah, that's me. But I wanted to tell stories through acting. And when you're like, I don't know, 14, 13 or whatever... And you want to play dramatic roles like, I don't know, Dracula or Norman Bates and things like that. Um, no one's going to knock on your door when you're 13 and go, hey, you'd be great for that. So we just got a camera and was like, right, I need to act. The only way I can act and do what I want to do is if I make my own films. And then it kind of, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like the girl who, um, you know, says, OK, fine, I'll bake some cookies. Uh, you know, I'll bake some cakes for your birthday and then somehow it's like wow I love this and I'm good at it and then they become <laughs> yeah. a baker do you know what I mean so in that relation so, then what, what was to you like the first film like the first film that you go this is my first film um I think I asked my dad for a camera you know as as you do not that it was like some sort of privileged like um rich family or anything like <laughs> that you know I was always really well looked after but we, you know we're you know working class or whatever so um, we got a camera in like, I can't remember when, it was like 2002, 2001 or something like that. And we made this zombie movie. Literally, it arrived that day. And then I called my friend up and was like, the camera's arrived, let's make a movie. So then we just went and did this awful zombie movie with like ketchup and food colouring and, you know, and, and we just painted, my parents had just painted my kitchen yellow, or their kitchen, should I say. Um, and we did a, a shot where somebody got shot in the head and we sprayed blood everywhere. And then we were like frantically trying to clean it up before they got home. So it was, it was yeah, it was as you'd expect. But good fun though, to like just be able to die. It was great fun, yeah. It wasn't great fun watching the film. It was the film that we vowed to never mention again. <laughs> but then we've all got films like that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> So if we talk about like the, the early films that went after that, um, there's two films in particular, like Deadly Pursuit and oh, yeah. um, the Halloween fan film you did. Oh, yeah. So we yeah, can talk well, a bit about them. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, that was, a, that was a pretty funny sort of time. It was a time when I felt like I was kind of arriving in, in, in a way. It, like, don't get me wrong, none of this stuff is particularly good. The stuff like uh, Deadly Pursuit, um, Spirits of the Fall, uh, you know, um, the Halloween one, I, 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 I would tolerate that. But the <laughs> ones before, it's kind of like, please don't go and look for them. Just take my word that, you know, you, you know what it's like. Yeah, you're a yeah, filmmaker. Yeah. You, you, everyone's got those movies. But they're like, oh, I'd really love to see that. And you're like, mm, I don't want you to see it, really. But, um, and, and that was like when, you know, I got, you know, a more decent camera and things were moving along. Um, and it just felt a little bit more real. You know, there was a proper mm. script. There were actors who had come in from London who had been in big films and things like that. Not big name actors, but actors who had some sort of gravitas to them. So whether or not what we were making, you know, the outcome was that great. It was, it was learning in a true sense, like we were in a real film, you know, um, working with real people who, who had real experience you know and it was like 2007 I was like I don't know how old I was I must have been 19 something like that so I did Deadly Pursuit was like a um, it was like it had everything in it it felt easy because it was like crooked cops and there's gun fights and there's fights and it, it was all set around urban city which is where I lived and it just felt like an easy thing to do and then Spirits of the Fall the next one 
which came before the Halloween film. That was the one that really kind of just kind of broke me in, really, mm. because it wasn't. It was a halfway. It wasn't dreadful, but it wasn't. I still wouldn't want to watch it now, but it wasn't one that I like hide away. And it was the first film I ever got distributed, like properly as as a kid. And and I, and I got royally ripped off, yeah. um, which which I don't mind because the only way I would have got that film out was you know through being ripped off i suppose and i'll take that because if someone says to me now would you rather have your film in every every corner of the world in it in every um let's say theoretically if blockbusters still existed you know it, you know we have it in every blockbuster but you won't see a penny of it sometimes you just have to say you know what that's invaluable it's not always about money especially yeah, not yeah, when yeah. you're 19 and you're just trying to you know and and, and that was the movie that got me you know, an email from Stephen King who said he saw the film and he loved the story. And so that was a huge major thing for me. As a writer, I was like, what? You know, because I wasn't really interested in writing. Again, writing was only ever a necessity. It still is, although I enjoy it a bit more now. It's still only a necessity in my mind. I never want to be known for being a writer. If I do a film, I want someone to say, yeah, the writing is good, but I'm not bothered about, oh, he's a screenwriter. And do you know what I mean? It was yeah, just, yeah. I just did it because... I had to. So you can't you, make a film without a script. We, you, know, you can, but, you know, go on. I was just going to say, um, have you ever considered in that respect, like, working with other screenwriters? See, this is where it gets sticky. This is where it gets <laughs> tricky with my personality type. Um, no. <laughs> just because it, it, it's, it's awful. It's really bad. It's like, it's the same with the music. Um, I don't want to be known as a songwriter. I'm not really interested in that side. I just write the songs because I want to perform them. Mm. But yet, if someone says to me, hey man, you know, I've written a song, I'd be like, thanks, but no thanks. Because I just I just don't write, um, you know, I don't tend to produce other people's stuff. If a, uh, a screenwriter or a company came to me and said, we've got a script, we think you'd be the right director for it, then in that capacity um i could stretch to a collaboration mm. on that level but as in terms of sitting down um you know at two in the morning uh, with another screenwriter just kind of you know um getting out and and, and spitballing or whatever that's not me that that's that's just never going to be me unless something in that project really really calls for it where you know you know when aaron sorkin calls i'll think about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> But no, seriously, it's just like, it's just a solitary thing for me writing, you know, and mm. an idea comes in and then it's not even like an idea. It's like, there's the finished film. It's like a little ball of something that pops into my head, like a tumor. And then I just have to pick it out and then spread it all over the paper. And then that's it. It's it's not a, oh, I'm writing. It's I love being a writer. I just don't get that feeling from it. I do it as a necessity. And, and the Halloween film, so I didn't mention that. It was just great fun because it was, um, you know, it was like anything. You knew people were going to watch it because it had the Halloween name on it. And it was everything you expected it to be. And it was nice to do a film where, where we actually dialed it back because there's very little gore or anything. It's very much like German expressionism. I, I tried to make it more like, you know, part one. I'd love to do another one one day, but who knows? You never know. Opportunity never know. could always come along. Um, I'm not sure if you, you... We don't have to talk about this. I, think I can easily just cut this bit out, but it's up to you. If we could talk about Discarnate. Yeah, sure. I'd love to talk about that. Because that was a fantastic uh, project that like, you were working on like years ago. And we even had old Jackson Bachelor as your lead actor. and Yeah. It's a yeah. story well, still. Well, I mean, obviously... Well, I mean, you know, I met Jackson, um, you know, through you. Because mm. originally I, th I was thinking of you for the part <laughs> because I thought, it, you know, it's not always about who's right or who's wrong for the character. I don't always have an overly visual idea of a character. Like I don't necessarily write a character and go, man, that has to be that actor. That's all I can see. Mm. But it's more about who do I really like and who have I worked with and who do I trust and who do I know who can perform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, you know, so then obviously you were doing more of a sort of a managerial role with Jackson. Mm. Uh, and, and, and just for the record, I just have to say he, he was, he, you know, he was, he is amazing. And, and I loved working with him. And 
you know what? If I had done that movie with a bunch of assholes, it would have been easier because I felt so much remorse. So I'll quickly tell you the story really quickly. So the film is like a supernatural thing. It was like my it was going to be like I hate to use words like my big comeback, but it, I hadn't done much filming in a while. Music had been incredibly busy, which I'm always happy for. Um, but you know, we put the film together. We were about ninety percent finished. Um, and, you know, I, I moved, I relocated up the country, which wasn't really much of an issue in terms of filming. I was prepared to come back and finish off all the other bits. Um, and we had the, the, the van that we used for the movie. We had all this stuff in it, of course. And I had a box, a special box that I hid under the seat um, that has all of my hard drives on it. And people say, well, why didn't you have it backed up? Well, I was like, the, the box was filled with about seven hard drives. So yeah. it was backed up several times. Cloud storage now... I'm a little bit more at ease with it, but back then, it, it just I, wasn't just possible, wasn't. was it? Yeah, it was no, hard. No, <laughs> it was expensive. I didn't, I didn't believe it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't believe it. Mm. I still am a bit dubious about cloud storage because I'm like, what's stopping some grubby guy in the depot from having a little look through? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not that there's anything I'm worried about the scene, but there's just something about that. It's like handing over your blood, sweat, and tears to someone else who you don't even see or know or talk to. And you're paying them for the privilege. Um, but I know that now it's it's a lot more secure. So that's just me being a bit of a technophobe. But yeah, so anyway, long story short, I guess someone broke into the van or something happened that I could never get to the bottom of. And it's as simple as this. The box was nicked. The box was gone. There is dual responsibility. I'm never going to blame solely the other person who took them because it could have been a mistake. It could have been a theft. Um, you know... Second-hand hard drives are worth nothing. Mm. You know, you can buy them, but I would have paid them good money to get those hard drives back. They would have made more money, I guarantee you, if they'd come to me. Because there was all sorts of stuff on those hard drives, like old songs, family photos, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. Over 10 years' worth of work. Old movies that I'd done, all sorts of things. So, but again, the responsibility... Uh, it was a long day. There was a big move, and uh, you know I just must have missed something. You know, so uh, so the hardest part really wasn't. Sure, I ripped my hair out for like ten minutes when I was like, "Fuck, I can't believe I've lost." Excuse my language. I can't believe I've lost the um, the film. But really, the real pain, the stingy bit, was when I had to go and email everyone and grovel and basically say, "You've done an amazing job. Everything is absolutely fantastic. I'm so sorry. I've lost the film, and it's mm-hmm. over." Yeah, it's, that's pain. Because <laughs> you so, have, on IMDb, of course, you can see some of the fantastic behind the scenes of some of the, the scenes and sets and uh, some of the design of the creature and stuff. And it is, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a real shame. It is a shame. It is, a, it, you know, even if I couldn't have finished it and I had, still had the footage to do something with it, it would have been better. But, yeah. you know, but what I will say, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a positive guy and I try and find the, um, you know, the silver lining in, in, in everything. And all I will say is, looking back at it now, um, the production ran along quite a long time. And even in the, in the two years of the filming, um, the horror business, the horror scene changed. Yeah. So what would have been possibly acceptable or exciting or whatever, when I started the film in 2014 or whatever, would maybe not, um, excuse me, uh, maybe might not have looked as um, exciting when it would have been finished in, say, 2017, 2017, mm. uh, 18, when we would have finished it. And, you know, horror moves very quickly, uh, horror changes, and then it stays somewhere for a while. And at the moment, we're on this kind of like even keel of a bit of Blumhouse, a bit of Insidious, a bit of this and a bit of that. But there, was n- there wasn't really an awful lot of that in that film. So I think now, um, I just think, well, look, it didn't get released. It happened, but there's always better projects to, to, to go into. It was just a shame that it delayed more time because now we're looking at 10 years since I last released the film. Yeah. That's absolutely ridiculous. And people forget your name really quickly. People, you know, I've had people who have done horror documentaries and all sorts of things, and they've sort of, you know, said, oh, yeah, I didn't ask you because I didn't think you were making horror films anymore. And, and that's painful mm. because on one hand, I'm like, yeah, the music's going great, like better than great. But, 
you know, the film thing is still so important to me. So it's very hard when you have like, it's like having two sons or two yeah. kids. You know, you love them both equally, even though sometimes it may appear the other way. But one's really successful, one's doing really well, and one's been a bit of a struggle, but yet you still love it, obviously. And it's a little bit like that. So I, I may spend a bit more time with this other kid now, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But I still love the other one. And you're going to see a reunion like you've, you've never seen before because, you know, things are happening. I, I, I never, ever, ever, ever would ever say, no, that's it. I'm, I'm easing up on the film stuff. I just go with the flow and I go with what has success at that time. You know, if the music thing completely dries out and it becomes a complete flop, then I'll go back to filming. And I pushed the film stuff recently because I don't know when I'm going to gig again, obviously because of the COVID and all that stuff. Um, and I'm not a type, the type of guy to sit around and cry about, oh, I can't do this at the minute. I'll just get on and do something else. Mm. That's just the way I am, you know? And it almost, you know what the, the most messed up thing, the way my, my brain works was when I realized that the hard drives were gone and I'd lost this film, obviously there's everything you expect, you know, um, sadness and frustration and anger at other people, anger at myself. But then there was this little moment quite quickly after, well, this is exciting. I can do any film I want now because I don't have to finish that film. So even though I'm gutted that tours have been cancelled and I can't go on tour at the minute, there is a part of me that's like, oh, it's exciting. I can sit and write that script I wanted to write or do you know what I mean? Mm. So e e everything is opportunity um, rather than, oh, I can't believe I can't go out or I can't believe I can't do this. I always go, yeah, that's rubbish but oh i can do this or the more exciting question is oh, what can i do now do you know what i mean yeah, yeah so i've always been driven by that um, um and that stops you from i think it stops you from killing yourself sometimes you know because people really get down and out and stuff and it's like at the end of the day it's just a movie or mm -hmm. it's just a band you know let's look at what you were doing so before we get to <clears throat> your most recent film project You've obviously been doing a lot of film scores for a lot of different filmmakers across the world. We've been quite lucky that you've had that you scored Lonely Hearts, uh, the the, uh, oh, yeah. the truth will out, and soon to be scoring Monstrous and the Unwanted. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a different side that I don't think everyone really knows what goes into the process of when you're thinking and watching a film and going, all right, how does this sound, and what's the sound I'm going to create yeah. here? So tell us a bit about that sort yeah. of process. It's fun because this is the thing where no one asks, no one, no one cares, no one asks, no one ever. You never really get a chance to talk about this um, because it's almost like because you do it in such a solitary way. No one, like when you, if you're advertising that you're doing a film score, you're advertising a movie, you're marketing a movie, you're not mm. marketing the film score. So I go, hey, I'm doing this for Monstrous. I'm not saying, hey, everyone, come and look at the film score. I'm saying, hey, I'm doing this on a new movie. Go check out that, that movie. Mm. So people kind of sidestep the score thing, even though that's really what you're talking about. And it's the strangest thing ever because no one really knows or cares what goes on in a little studio when you're scoring. Um, you know, unless you, you're one of those people like me who buy a DVD and you find it interesting or you're looking at, I don't know, interviews with Danny Elfman on YouTube and things like that. But most of the time... It's not like the making of the movie. It goes even more unnoticed. Mm. So, but yeah, the process of finding out the sort of, um, I don't know, the sonic mood, you know, because these days, um, a lot of the score is sound design. If you look back at like 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, and go all the way back to like 2003, films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, um, all those types, the scores are all like drones and noises. Yeah, yeah. At that point, the, the the sort of conventional horror score was gone. When Insidious came out and it was all really loud strings, um, it brought back the old school score. Mm. It, it changed everything. Because, it, because I remember a time distinctly watching um, a horror film with, with an ex-girlfriend. And it was very like psycho type style of music and she was like god the music's a bit crap and i was like this is classic this is like i'm not saying it, it works right now but it, this is classic old school film score so that's been brought back 
by stuff like Insidious and that, you know, that overly in the foreground, you know, kind of score. Mm. But, you know, I just, I like to watch the film and I like to look at other films that are similar and what they're doing. And I like to listen to the, the director and, 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 you know, the crew and see what they think it should sound like. Cause it's not just about me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's such a big collaboration. <clears throat> um, Sometimes I like to play music to the actual screen as it's playing. And sometimes, you know, when I was in college making films, we didn't have our own film scores. So we used to take other film scores and chop them up. So we already had, the music was already there. And we just went, oh, that sounds good. We'll use that. Mm. So now a lot of time, I find it easier to go away and say, right, this movie is about this, 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 and this. Uh, what sort of sounds are we going to need? And then I will go and write a score um, without watching the film or I'll watch the film and then I'll write the score but then I will cut it up and and put it to the film rather than sit and do the film in order so I may play a piano piece with one scene in mind but it might not get used in that scene okay. because you know I'm still of that style of like what film scores can we nick and cut up to make them sound like they work for our college film you know everything to me goes back to the early days of filmmaking when you're in college when you're a kid and i try so hard to do everything quote unquote right and 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 how you know bigger directors do it and bigger composers and whatever but you know i'm not them and i'm not as big as that and i don't have that big crew around me so now i'm like you know what just embrace the fact that you're a guerrilla performer on, on every level you know, I'm happy to be a low-budget guerrilla filmmaker. I'm happy to do scores on in that way, the way I did them in college or whatever. So it's it's just about finding your groove. But then guys like Robert Rodriguez are the same, you know. Yeah, they, yeah. You know, that to me is absolutely amazing and unfathomable how one guy can have so much control in Hollywood. He's like the only guy doing it. No, I totally um, agree. You know, and... Again, I've said this a couple of times recently. A few people have said to me, years ago, not that long ago, like less than 10 years ago, I was ridiculed. A lot of people would, would you know, people who weren't in the industry, I, I, I must add. But a lot of people would be like, man, why do you do so many things? You know, why why don't you just direct? Mm. Or why don't you just be a composer? Or, oh, what, you want to be out on tour and you're doing the film? It's like it's too much. And it's almost like, oh, look, you've written it, you've directed it, you're in it, you know. And that is somewhat embarrassing in a way when people pick up that aspect of it almost like you can't do any better mm. but now it's like in just you know less than 10 years um now it's really respected to be self-contained self-sufficient and and the um the opinion of that has changed completely and now it's quite trendy for people to be like a one-man band and i think a lot of that came from like youtube bloggers and things where it's just like one person who's crafted their entire channel and i like to clever, um, you know i like to also think that like those in that situation <clears throat> most of them are, are kind of they're never going to get a step up in the industry because of maybe they say their social class or whatever in that situation that you sort of have to yeah. take on those roles yourself to be able to get yeah. the things actually created and i've always it is the to me, it's almost like the, the better approach when you don't have that money to be able to pay everyone within a film, try and take on as much responsibility as yourself because you'll get that creation and maybe get the opportunity in the future. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I, I think that the more responsibility, you know, because I used to think, why is it a bad thing that I can do these jobs? Mm. Because, <clears throat> you know, there's always this lifelong thing of don't try and be a jack of all trades don't try and do more than one thing. You'll never succeed as well on that. And, you know, it's totally true. It's like when I was in my old band, um, I was playing the drums and singing at the same time. It's not easy. The drumming was never going to be as good when I'm trying to sing and the singing was never going to be quite as good, you know, when I'm trying to drum at the same time. That's a, that's a given, mm. you know. You'll never be able to put 100% or, or 200% maybe into an acting performance if a percentage of that is taken away from thinking about the directing. But you may be able to give 97%. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean it's wrong or bad. And some people have a knack. And I'm a multitasker. I like to have several things going at once. You know, when I'm working, I like to have a film on. 
it's, it, you know, I like to be watching something, taking something in while I'm working or, you know, it's just the way my mind works. Yeah. But now it's almost like people come to you and, you know, they're kind of like shocked that you do so many things. And I don't think, I think when I was starting to do that, I was kind of like, I stuck out a bit. But now I just think that more people are getting that way and they're realizing that, like you said, because of social classes and all these different factors, um, I, I think that people aren't being handed the opportunities based on their talent and they're having to go off and do it on their own. Mm. And, and I think that's fine and great because half of what people are producing out of the, the love of their own heart and their passion is so much better than a lot of stuff that's coming out just to make money, you know, using actors and things that are flavor of the month, you know, because how many projects do you see? And you're like, oh, no, not this again. Yeah, you know yeah. I, mean? I mean, look, I love Tim Burton, but after a while it was a bit like, oh, hell in the bottom car. Oh, Johnny Depp again. Oh, really? You know, and, and I love all of them. It's really, a repetition is safety, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and again, there's always that part of you that's like, oh, yeah, I love to see that crew do their thing. Or I love to see that actor, you know. But again, it's nice to have something different because I think it's time for some new blood. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So what are you working on right now? Now, when I say right now, I don't mean, I mean like in the last year or so because obviously with the other big major crazy thing happening, some people have stopped. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what I'm not working on, is it's not going to be any sort of virus or outbreak. Yeah, film. yeah. Only that. because, you know, how so many people have messaged me and, and asked me and been like, hey man, you should, you should do, I love it because when people think you're a filmmaker, they go, they pick any story that seems vaguely interesting to them. And they go, oh, you should do a film about that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you're like, what? Really? Um. So I, I definitely won't be doing anything about... It's like the lockdown. I'm working on an album, a new solo album, just because I thought, you know, I wasn't planning on it for a long time, really wasn't planning on it. I had other material I was trying to push first, but I thought, ah, you know what, I can't go on tour. At the, as of the time when I planned to do the album, there was no filming going on whatsoever. So I was like, I, this could be just a bit of fun, really, you know. So people go, you're going to write a song about the lockdown? I'm like, no, because I don't want it to be dated. Yeah. I just want it to be like any other project, like the, like a film. If I made a film during lockdown, I'd want it to be like any other film. I wouldn't want to date it and have it sit in a pile with all the other movies that people and, and albums and songs that people have done because they can't go out. Yeah. Um, I, I'm ready to make a movie or, or write an album at any time. But I only want it to be good and I don't want it to be like, hey, everyone, I recorded this in my shower. Do you know what I mean? Mm. That's not I, I'm afraid I find that cheapens things. You know, I find that that puts a, a stamp on something that, that immediately dates it. If someone makes a film, a short film, and puts it on a, a forum, you know, they if it's their first film and they're only 16, that's great. But I do feel like sometimes it's good not to say that. I think sometimes it's good to be like, hey, here's a film. Yeah. Watch it and tell me what you think. Rather than, hey, everyone, this is a film I made. I'm only 15 and I filmed it on you know, my calculator or whatever. I, I feel like, don't say that. Just put it out there and don't make a big deal about how you're um, you know, underprivileged when you made it or how you, I just think, just see what comes back from it. You know, Just let it sit as its own thing. So, yeah, that's what I'm working on. I'm doing an album. Obviously, the score for you. I've got another couple of scores coming up. I've got a score for a Danish film, which has been... Um, I've been told to make it sort of John Carpenter-esque, nice. which is fun. Yeah, yeah, which is... Yeah, I always enjoy that. I'm doing sound... Well, I'm doing sound... I was originally supposed to be doing sound design and the score on a film called The Rage 2, which is like a zombie outbreak. I said I wouldn't be doing any outbreak films, but this is a zombie outbreak film. And this was filmed before the lockdown. <laughs> so before I eat my words, I, I have to say. Um, so I'm doing that. And that kind of got wild because I thought, wow, zombies, you know, they had loads of locations uh, lined up. So I said to the director, I said, look, I'll, I'll, do, I'll, do, the, I'll do the score. I'd love to. Um, how about if I do this deal, uh, I'll come and put on some clothes and, and, and I'll, I'll do some stunt work. I'll, I'll do a couple of zombies because I'm like, man, I can, I can add a bit of money to your film by throwing myself off a building or, or, or whatever, you know. Because when you see things like that, 
it does take it to a slightly further level of like, oh, okay. So, and plus with the zombie thing, it's so easy. You can get dressed up, I can shave my beard, cut my hair, I could be 10 zombies. So I thought, this would be really fun. Um, and then there were problems with the actor, and because the film, I don't want to give away too much, but because the film is all shot first person like a video game, um, I was able to replace the lead actor, so now I'm re-recording all of the lead actor's dialogue. Um, so basically, somehow I've wormed my way in to being <laughs> the, the composer, the stuntman, and the lead actor. And, and I've done a poster, and I'm apparently I'm editing the trailer. So, it, But I love the project, and I feel like I just want to give it as much as I possibly can mm. so that it comes out really well. Because it's a sequel, and the first one, did really well on the festival circuit. It's won loads of awards. And it's great, but this is going to be a lot better. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, wow, this is incentive. You know, I can really go somewhere with this. So it isn't, you know, it's not my movie. There's a director and a writer, but he's, he, he trusts me and he's very willing to take on board ideas. And, you know, sometimes you just have to say, look, man, this will make it better. Trust me. Um, and, and you just have to hope that they, they do trust you. And you have to hope that you are right, ultimately. So I'm doing that. Um, I, I've got a bunch of posters I'm designing for clients. What else? Am I? And, of course, my own film that I'm doing, I'm halfway through production. Obviously, we did half of that before COVID broke through, um, and I'm sort of working out how to finish it off. And that's a horror anthology. It's three stories and a wraparound, so... And that's looking really fun. And that, you know, that won't be lost. And that's going to be the next film, I hope. (laughs) So there you go. That's what I'm that's what I'm working on anyway. Excellent, man. Well, thank you so much for having a chat with us. Um, We'll put some links down below so people can check out your music and whatever films are online. And yeah, I hope you have a good day. Thank you very much. I will see you soon. Speak soon. Bye bye. All right. Cheers. Bye bye. Cool, Sam. Thanks for that. Always good to hear from Rusty, good collaborator of yeah. ours. And um, so, yeah, basically, guys, we wanted to discuss documentaries and um, how documentaries can impact film or how documentaries are used as a film. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, coming into this, I think I've watched a fair few documentaries, but I haven't really been as privy to them or exposed, I suppose as uh, Sam and Jack have. And I know, Sam, you, you're quite big into your sort of timeline of documentaries. Do you want to kick us off? I think it's interesting with documentaries because to me, personally, documentaries can be in two forms, yeah? You've got them as journalism because they are a form of journalism. Mm, yeah. They're a form of us understanding things. But there's also the understanding of what it is to be human. So th- those two seem to be like the most things you kind of follow with documentaries. Yeah, I think so. But I think like you're right about the the almost there's an investigative form of documentary, mm. and then there's also like a, a, a character study, a, like essay yeah. form of yeah. I suppose because I a, a, yeah character study is right, but you know you can take that into a broader thing of like um, for example Michael Storrs, uh, Michael Morse, <laughs> um, uh, capitalism a love story, mm. um, where he sort of focuses on not discovering new information but just presenting that information and that's sort of like a character study but of like a not a character of of a system instead so you you know there's a i think that's the that's the interesting thing about documentaries is that they can have a direct impact Uh, most films um they can have they will have an impact but it's more of a subconscious impact a sort of uh background impact when you're watching them but a, a documentary feeds you information directly um which which can either change your mind or or affect change in a in a bigger sense well, by changing this a lot is of it. Minds. it literally can change the world mm. and when you, when you go back to how like documentaries in the beginning they were the only way for us to see the world if it was animal documentaries <coughs> or other cultures or the wars that were going on in, in the other times and stuff and when you think of recent documentaries that have literally j- attempted to change the world, at the very least, mm. if you remember uh, Blackfish, yeah, that documentary about Sea Life World was something that we c- we knew about, but we didn't know the finer details. Mm. And once we saw the abuse that was going on there, it created a mass effect. They had to like they had to re look at how that business worked, and I don't think it didn't like completely 
destroy all sea worlds, but it made you think a bit more about it. Yeah. And it's the same with um, the other, like more cultural one. I mean, despite Morgan Spurlock's recent problems, but Super Size Me, it did make people stop for a second and think, you know what? Let's not go for McDonald's because of this. What this we've watched the whole entire reality of a situation mm. do you find as well like whenever you watch a film or you're presented with content on tv like adverts and stuff like that there's almost a veil in front of it so when you watch a film there's a fourth wall that's the veil mm. when you watch an advert it's like oh this is great buy this or like again if you go off the mcdonald's stuff it's like oh yeah british food and irish yeah. food, things like that there's always that veil a documentary kind of goes behind the veil and it almost exposes, to a degree, exposes and gives you the true content. So when you're watching it, you're more engaged. And like you were saying, Jackson, is that you kind of you kind of react to it in a way that like, oh God, I need to do something about this. Yeah. It's, it's very empowering. I think that's it. With, with there being two sides, so you can either do a documentary from a very subjective understanding. So the, the director's walked in with their perspective and they're going to get you to learn and understand it. Yeah. Like Michael Moore does. Yeah. Like uh, 13th, the Netflix documentary that we were watching about the prison system. What a documentary. Um, yeah. But then you also have the objective perspective where it's someone walking in with no true understanding of what's going on and they kind of let... You get a lot with the pop boxes. You'll get every single side getting a chance to talk so you can get a sort of picture of it. Yeah. In some ways, um, the documentary... Again, it's a political documentary, but Get Me Roger Stone has an attempt to be objective. Yeah. Because it lets him speak. It lets his fans speak. It also lets his um, detractors speak. And I think it's good to... You can do a documentary in either way. It depends on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to learn about something or are you trying to get others to learn about something? Mm. You can do both in both sides because it's very ignorant to think that you're not going to learn something in understanding more. But I think that works in a way. If... if a documenter, kind of, I don't know if that's the right word. Documenter? Well, a documentarian or a documentary. Docu- doc- well, a guy who's director. basically, a guy who's basically going out there to um, do a bit of research and understand. I know this isn't strictly film, but the Tiger King, he never initially went to do it about tigers. It yeah. was something completely <clears throat> different. And then he found out this whole other world and you go on him with that journey. Yeah, that's the thing. You, I think it, it is a weird sort of thing. So you got a documentary called um, Capturing the Freedmans. And Capturing the Freedmans, the intention... It's a lot of stock footage. It's a lot of, um, like, about a family. And they're, they're kind of, like, out there family, very over the top. They always filmed everything. But then you find out there was a paedophilia within it. And you're seeing them, and it's it, you're capturing every single moment. But the documentarium had been... Filming parts, sure, but most of the footage itself is from what they've collected. So you're sort of gathering that story as it's going along. Yeah. Um, I mean, Werner Herzog had a similar thing with Grizzly Man. Like, yeah. it wasn't his intention to go out and make a documentary about people out bears. It's just he was that story, that man's story, really like was so captivating and so interesting yeah. with the footage that he caught was was incredible. But um, the other one that I was thinking about that you as you were talking about the uh, you know the journey of the documentary in itself is of course Nick Broomfield, um, yeah. who uh, you know he he approaches documentary um, well it's not that much differently but differently to the way that a lot of the people that we've mentioned so yeah. far have, um, where you know you're you're following him on his journey to find out this information. It's humanistic. And with um, Kurt yeah. and Courtney, yeah. um, the fact that he, he goes through that journey trying to find out about um, their relationship and just gets <laughs> blocked at yes. every single moment and then suddenly all of his documentary funding gets cut off and at the end he goes and he stands up in front of the, uh, the that, that award ceremony that Courtney um, Love has just won um, an award at and makes a speech about how she's awful and all the things that he's found out about. <laughs> and this wasn't planned. This wasn't, you know, he, he'd said during it, you know, I never wanted to um, get that involved in something that I'm trying to research and understand and study. Um, but that's what, that's kind of what ended up happening because he was so frustrated by mm. the whole process of making this documentary. And that's what good journalism is. So Errol Morris is the thin blue light. Mm. Um, <clears throat> that's about like two people who potentially committed this crime and at the end the guy eventually admitted that he committed the crime to Errol Morris 
And that that's just really good journalism. And I think that's what Nick Broomfield attempts with every single one of them. Like he wants to get to the truth and he'll go to those places. He'll outright ask those questions where he gives you the voiceover to think, I wonder what he's going to ask. And then he'll just ask it. Same with Werner Herzog. <laughs> There's these really strong personalities. And that's not to say every documentarian needs to be front and centre. No. Some documentaries work a lot better where it's not like that. But it, it, it all depends on the kind of story you're telling. Documentaries can really be moments where you can go, okay, that, that reflects on that point in history. Mm. And I don't mean in the documentaries that talk about history, I mean documentaries that come out of that time. So there's a documentary called Zero Days. I think that's what it's called. I keep getting confused in my head. <laughs> but it's the documentary about when Edward Snowden opened up and told his story and told all about the whistleblowing with the, the NSA. Yeah, this I documentary was made exactly the same time as when the Guardian journalist was there and the first article, of course, came out. And it's a stunning documentary because you're watching something that was capturing such a big moment in history. And I think, although you can do a dramatisation of that later on, it's never going to have the same impact no. as having real reactions. Real footage. Yeah, and that's the other thing. With documents, documentaries, editing can be the, the, the biggest tool because if you can watch something like a court case sequence in a documentary to the point where you forget you're watching real life because you've just got those cuts perfectly in place, you know? So immersed. Mm. And some people say that can be quite, you know exploitive a documentary by creating drama I think it sensationalises it it does but it depends in what context of the sort of documentaries I mean personally it seems to be something you see a hell of a lot more in documentary TV series yeah definitely than films films I always hope at least that a documentarian's approaching with some artistry and some like you know directing intent as opposed to I've got to get this series together and I'm doing this episode or we're just telling the story yeah I think that was one of the one of the problems with um, Tiger King, as you say, it's, it's TV, yeah. But um, is is it was massively sensationalizing the relationship, and it was a lot of fun and yeah, uh, yeah. very good. But it was basically gossip, a lot of it, mm. wasn't it? And and you know, so that I, I feel like documentaries are better when someone comes in and says, "I want to look at this and find out about this, co conduct research on this," mm. or I want to. Uh, essentially create a, a document of something that I feel about or something that, and collate information and put it together to present mm. it um, and uh, yeah those those are, those are what do, that's got to be what documentary aims to be and yeah I know it probably sounds very cliche but I think where documentaries sometimes fall apart is that they don't have a clear narrative purpose yeah. yeah like a start a middle feel and end. like in a series that you they're filling time yeah well not even kind of they kind of do fill time but it, it kind of becomes a little bit gung gun ho mm. and it's very sporadic and then you're jumping around here there and everywhere and it's like hold on what did that person and that, that, that and then you're just like holy crap like where the hell are we at <laughs> right now like um <clears throat> and with like a film documentary if it's done right where we watch the 13th yeah. Like thirteenth is absolute it's got a start and like I said to you, is it is very linear and it yeah. has a clear narrative and it takes Perfectly you through nice. the process. Like anyone who is thick as shit could watch that and then understand why mm. Black Lives Matter and um the whole protests and stuff behind that because it's done linearly and you can watch that and go, Oh shit, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it's because of social media and stuff yeah. nowadays that it seems like oh well they're attacking police or but they're not attacking police like they're protesting and then other <laughs> stuff happens mm. like police brutality whatever um but whenever you watch it in that kind of straightforward way it just it makes sense and it's cool and that's brilliant well, well, that's I think a brilliant docu docu uh, documentary with, with documentaries you would hope most of the time the intent is to inform yeah. It's not to misinform, it's to educate you and give you an understanding. Yeah. And to potentially change... Your, your perception. You, yeah, your perception, or even how... The world. I mean, that's on the bigger scheme of things, but... Well, it depends a, on what it is. Yeah, but. there's a particular documentarian I like called Amy Berg. And Amy Berg seems to focus around um, injustices towards... It's usually the abuse within some sort of, sort of system. So her first film, which I can't remember its name... But it's about the Catholic church abuse, the sexual abuse to boys. Um, and then she followed up one about the Just West Memphis Free. There's a lot of documentaries about 
the old sex abuse. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, she did one on the one on the West Memphis Free, um, and then she followed that up with one of the most essential documentaries about Hollywood abuse with an open secret. And then she did another one about sexual abuse within uh, the Mormon faith, and the sort of you know their weird secular parts that go away from it and do their own little cult thing yeah. um, called a, a prophet. And it is really interesting that you can keep exploring those things, and it really does open up and hopefully can change laws. It can ch it, it can give another person to look at that and go, I watched this and this made me go, actually, that's bad. And although as a society we should be a lot more beyond that, that something like that can teach us, isn't all art in some way there to teach us something? Yeah. yeah. But then I, I, I think with documentary as well, like you mentioned, this, um, this one particular documentarian, um, there is sort of a, a level of authorship to documentaries, Definitely. but... I think it, it's more of a insight into the way that people uh, that documentarian views things, the mm -hmm. way that they they see things. Like the, um, uh, Werner Herzog, for example, uh, all through his documentaries, there's this beautiful just poetry that comes out of what he's witnessing mm -hmm. and what he's seeing, and he uses uh, those those stories and his uh, way of thinking about them to sort of bring a new. Uh, idea to them that, that can sort of link into bigger things um, like the way that he, he looked at volcanoes in uh, oh, what 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 is it called uh, f no ah uh, the volcano one yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway the volcano the volcano one uh, look it up um, <laughs> oh, Netflix original yeah, I remember um but the way that he looks at volcanoes and looks at religion that surrounds those volcanoes and, and uh, the way that it's impacted the culture around them. I mean, when, when you said, oh, Werner Herzog's done this new documentary on volcanoes, I thought, oh, so it's going to be about molten rock and, you know, all of this scientific stuff. But he'd actually looked at it from a, a totally different perspective mm. to what uh, most documentaries would, would well, choose to look at with them. That's an interesting thing, like POV documentaries, which is... I mean, this is more from someone who's had, not me, but from a, the person who's directed it, who's had abuse, who's been abused. Mm. I've been seeing a lot more of these POV documentaries where because they are a filmmaker and they've experienced abuse themselves, they've found a way to document it. It's a perfect example of that with Holy, um, Holy Hell. Because mm. that's about someone who's been involved in a cult, was literally their videographer in the cult for 30 years, saw all the abuse, experienced it themselves, and just got this great collection of you know human abuse and on power and sexual and everything and just sort of create this beautiful documentary where he got to show the the survivors stories mm. um i recently watched a documentary called rewind and again it was a similar thing of, of this person watching back on his own home videos as a documentarian and realizing that he'd been abused and kind of bringing the pictures in talking to his own therapist from when he was 10 years old to get more of an understanding and I think that's a really beautiful thing. And I hope you get to see more of that within documentaries where you're seeing more from those who've had the experience telling their stories rather than just the documentarian deciding artistically how to tell their story. Can I change the pace a little bit <clears throat> and ask you no. guys a question? <laughs> um, so, yeah, like informative documentaries are absolutely brilliant and I love them to pieces myself. But <clears throat> obviously being a sports fan... <laughs> I know you guys obviously aren't sports fans. I like sports documentaries though. Yeah, well that's what I was going to ask. Is like, what's your take on sports documentaries? Wait, Do you think again, there's enough of them? I, th I think with, <clears throat> with sports documentaries, in particular the ones I've seen, you've, it's usually a character study. It's usually like one of the greatest sports documentaries, um, The Greatest Fight in the World with Muhammad Ali. It's about him. It's about him preparing for it. It's about his... His other, the other guy, which I can't remember his name, I think it was George Foreman, um, they were like, you know, both preparing for the fight, you're seeing it, and it's all just the training, it's them getting, building the buzz, and then you see the actual fight. And I think that's the key with a great sports documentary, is you see all that preparation. Yeah. There's a great one called uh, Murderball. Murderball is about disabled people who play like rugby, but really aggressively, and they're really big personalities, and just... They like to take the piss out of their situations. It's a lot of like body dysmorphia, not body dysmorphia, but 
you know, like they've lost limbs and stuff, but they're still playing it and they're yeah, really yeah, aggressive yeah. and like, yeah. <laughs> the love and, of the sport. Yeah, and all those documentaries will always lead to a similar end point. And it's, it's a similar thing you see in music documentaries as well, where it's going to be a big concert or it's going to be a big event. And you're going to see that journey of when they've trained up to it and, and all the other people around them and probably some adversaries once. So in Murder Ball, you see like the Canadian teams and the other country teams and just see what they're like. And they're all nuts. They're all crazy. This sport is mental. But you, but I think sports documentaries really play with that sort of wanting to see someone to succeed, generally. Or Gem- you see someone being cut down at their prime when they were great. <clears throat> And it's funny you say that because my favourite sports documentary is Senna. Mm. I absolutely love Senna. Like, it's two hours and 42 minutes long and like I've watched it umpteen amount of times. Do you know the story of Senna, Jackson? No. Okay, Formula One driver. Um, basically, he was the last person until 2014 to die while racing. Um, so something like a spring flew up from his car, hit him right on the temple, like where his helmet was, and he then just fucking went into the um, barriers and died. But the whole documentary is like a build up of his career and how he got into motor racing, and you get all these behind the scenes sort of videos and um, pictures and stuff, and then it gets to a point where he dies, and then it's a slight change of pace of how the FIA then decided to change the regulations, make it more safe, and um, yeah, just how it revolutionised safety, health and safety within racing, um, and until Jules Bianchi in 2014, which was tragic, like, um, yeah, no one had died in F1, people have died in other motorsports, but um, no one had died in F1, but it's so powerful, it's so impactful, you're watching this guy who was beloved, and I think this is it. Like documentaries help you to remember. Yeah. They help you to remember but things they, that think, should be remembered. Yeah, it's either a person or an event or a social issue. I think they give you that. They they give you the impetus to remember, but they also give you a bit more of an underlying understanding of who they were. Yeah. And like a more behind the scenes look. So again, with the curtain, you kind of get to go behind the scenes and see their family mm. life and <clears> their everyday life. Like, yeah, it's just beautiful. I love that. So. Thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast this week. Um, please check us out on Spotify. We're now on Spotify. First six episodes are on there. We've also launched our new website, which is www.trasharts.co.uk. Leave us a like. Leave us a comment. If you've got any suggestions of what you'd like us to talk about, please put it in the comment section below. Please you can subs- still invest money into Senseless as well, yeah. if you wish. We're <laughs> that- so close to our target. We're 84%. And we've still got, I believe, just over 25 days. So please help and support if you can. Yeah, that'd the be awesome. Will be below, on the moon. <laughs> we'll put the link below. And uh, yeah, please subscribe, guys. As ever, thank you for supporting us. And uh, Trash Arts, take out. Bye-bye.